Brian Miller, welcome to the Star Tribune. Thank you for having me here today. We'll get right into the questions. So tell us about a vote Mike Enzi's made uh, with which you disagreed and, and tell us why you would have voted differently. Wow, and initially, <laughs> that's actually a, a real simple one for me because the, the one vote that really made me start looking at him or the one um, piece of legislation that he's wanting to try to pass is the, uh, the sales tax on the internet that I really absolutely don't agree with. I don't agree that it could possibly fall under the Commerce Clause because I don't see how you can tell individuals and businesses in one state to collect taxes for another state. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. I think that falls more in line of a, a tariff rather than something that falls under the Commerce Clause. I mean, I would be collecting taxes for someone that I don't have any opportunity to vote or have any power in that state to have them, you know, to control whatever they do in the state. I can see collecting sales tax here in Wyoming, but I can't see collecting it for somebody somewhere else. Isn't that the whole point of the Interstate Commerce Clause? Is to, to regulate relations, economic relationships between businesses and consumers across state lines? That is true, but I'll tell you, the, the Commerce Clause is way overused. And almost anybody will tell you that. In Congress, anything that they want to get passed, they throw at the Commerce Clause. It's not the intent of the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause is, is, is meant basically to keep free trade between the states and so that they don't end up um, you know, having tariffs and, and taxing people and keeping people from driving one product from here through Colorado down to New Mexico. That's more what the Commerce Clause is all about, but it's been utilized in many different ways over the years. And I think the sales tax is one of those ways. The sales tax on the internet is one of those ways. Besides that, I, I don't want to create another giant bureaucracy on top of the IRS. I mean, you're talking, what, some 9,000 different districts that have different sales taxes? The, the bureaucracy, they have to control that, even if they try to do software. I mean, look at the software that came out for Obamacare. They can't, can't even do that. That's only 50 states. <laughs> you know, we're talking 9,000 different districts that they have to keep up with. I don't think that's tenable either. Um, and I don't, uh, I absolutely do not want to add more bureaucracy in D.C. That's one of the things I'm running on is to, to bring the power back to the states. The Tenth Amendment is very important to me. And I would like to see a lot of the regulatory powers in Washington, D.C. move back to the states. We can talk more about that later if you want to get to that. Sure. Well, with the, and I'll just stick with this. Sure. Right the, with, the, uh, with the United Sales Tax, the whole point, of course, is to, is to actually, um, Level the playing field for sure. local businesses yes, that's who, who yep. you know, do have to charge a tax. That's that's they, the claim. We want to make it fair across the board. And you don't think that would, that would take I do not. I think if you're going to do something about that, why don't you lower the taxes on the folks that are here so that people will stay here and not, not order it from somewhere else? That would be a much better method. Lowering the taxes rather than adding tax burden to people. The Internet right now is the one thing out there that is effectively free other than having to get access to it. You have the opportunity on the internet. People have the opportunity right, to start businesses. And there are a lot of people I know that have home businesses where they sell things. And they're barely making it. But they're doing something on their own. They're not living off the government somewhere down the line. You know? And doing an internet sales tax is going to cause them to either hire somebody to run that for them, or they're going to have to bring in some software that's probably more expensive than they can afford. And it'll put the small businesses out of business. I don't see how it could possibly help small businesses. Um, when you look at, at the folks who are supporting this internet sales tax, they are not necessarily the small businesses, but they're the big businesses, the big box stores and folks like that that don't use the internet. They're the ones that are trying to, in effect, penalize someone like Amazon so that they can have people shopping more along with them. And that's not, we're not supposed to be using laws to penalize people. And I, I just don't agree with that. I also think freedom on the internet is a big thing. Putting this internet tax out there is, uh, is one of those things that will start in, in, infringing on the freedom of the internet. It's, it'll be the first By taxing step. taxing Congress on the internet? Absolutely. Yep. It'll be, it's the first step. I mean, that's how it always ends up happening. You end up having you know, the first little inch, and then the next thing will happen, and then the next thing, and eventually they start controlling things on the internet. And I don't want that. I mean, we already see the White House you know, um, wanting to go ahead and take the IP address there. They, oh, I can't think of what it's called now. The, uh, the dots, dot com, dot net, mm -hmm. and all that. And, let, um, and put that somewhere else in the world instead of the United States controlling it. We're the freest nation in the world, no matter how you slice it. And by doing that, we will end up limiting the internet as well. And that's the, it, you know, we start doing the taxing and we start doing things like that, we're just going to start eliminating the one free uh, system that we have to communicate with each other 
um, and to get the word out and talk to people. And I have a hard enough time doing that as a candidate with no money, getting my name and face out there. And I, I could not see that happening in the future if we end up you know, pushing the internet into a place where it's regulated very heavily. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Washington politics. Always, okay. always a great topic. But relevant if you were if you were hoping to get any goals achieved. Sure. Uh, if you were if you were a senator. So obviously politics there are polarized and that's certainly nothing new. Yep. But how would you succeed in that environment and, and ensure that your legislation would pass? Well I'll tell you, one of the things that I, I uh, was very fortunate in the military in doing is I was not just a pilot in the Air Force. I flew KC one thirty fives, I did did and had a, a good time doing that around the world. Uh, you know, doing America's business all around the world. Um, but I had three jobs while I was in the Air Force that dealt with diplomacy, that dealt with cooperation, and that dealt with coordination of organizations, big organizations, sometimes nations, where we're trying to figure out how to get people that didn't want to work together to work together. And I was very successful at that. And a lot of my bosses from the military can tell you that. Um, I ended up being the chief of presidential advance at the, uh, at the White House, or not the White House, but at the Pentagon, working for the White House for Air Force One. And uh, part of the reason I ended up getting there was because I was so successful in getting what we needed from all the foreign countries that we went to in order to have a safe and expeditious trip in and out of country. So I think I can do that here. I mean, if I was able to get the French to allow me to have everything that we wanted on our list, and I was the first agent in a couple of decades to make that happen. And if you get the French, to give you what you want. I think I can deal with a few senators and congressmen in D.C. So you've seen members of Congress happily take uh, federal debt obligations to the brink of default. Uh, <laughs> would you back such a move in the future? And if so, under what conditions? Federal debt obligations to the brink of default. Ah, let's see. Um, I think that, that the national debt is a, a, a big threat to our liberty and freedom in the United States. Um, I, I would have to see exactly how would you know someone would go about doing that? I do believe that there are better ways than going to the brink of debt and having people wait till the last minute and then they're going across. Um, I don't think I'm quite that extreme, but I have some good ideas on how to bring that debt down rapidly, how to balance the, the budget very quickly, and then start eliminating that debt. And we have to eliminate that debt. That debt cannot stand. We cannot afford to keep that around for our children and our grandchildren. So give me your best idea. My best idea. My best idea. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> All right. On the federal government side, one of the biggest things that I see that's a problem is the regulatory powers that have been consolidated in Washington, D.C. They have pulled powers up to Washington, D.C. that should not be there. The Tenth Amendment says everything that's not enumerated in the U.S. Constitution, 17 or so, should be left to the states and the individuals. That has not happened for a very long time. Some states have gotten lazy. Some states that have a lot more votes in Congress, in particular, have gotten lazy, and they've allowed a lot of things to move up to the federal level. That is a problem across the board, because the more things you bring up to the federal level, the more expensive they are. Okay? If you have a problem in the city, you know, in, in, a, in a typical town in, in Wyoming, um, let's say the city makes a financial faux pas, it may cost tens of thousands of dollars or maybe $100,000 in, in error on that, that side. For the state, maybe millions or tens of millions. At the federal government, it almost always starts at the billion dollar level. Why? Because you're dragging all this power up to Washington, D.C., and you're having this huge bureaucracy of people that don't need to be there. And I say that because organizations like the EPA and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Forest Service, all of which who are actually impacting all three of Wyoming's primary industries, agriculture, energy, and tourism, are impacting the state horribly by going back and using the rulemaking process to implement policy that the president wants without going through Congress through the rulemaking process. Um, one of the things I want to do is fix that, and I'll talk about that in a second. But we have our own DEQ in Wyoming. We have our own Game and Fish. We don't need the EPA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they are redundant, and they are expensive. You have a massive bureaucracy in D.C. of regulatory people. If those jobs came back to the states, yeah, you got to do those jobs. I get it. But let's do it at the state level where we're a lot more efficient and don't cost so much. People who are doing those jobs in D.C. get paid between one hundred fifty and $300,000, I know, because I've lived there for a few years at the Pentagon 
and I, I couldn't believe the amount of pay people got to live there. Well, it's expensive there. If they come back to the states, they do the job for the state, they can get paid a quarter of that and live pretty doggone well here in Wyoming. And we can take that difference, put it back toward the debt, or leave it in the state and leave it in the hands of the people who are here. Um, so that's my primary way. So let's talk about energy exports of coal and natural gas. What, what would you do to help Wyoming products make it to foreign consumers? Well, the first thing I'd do is I'd, I'd bring all of that, that uh, regulatory power out of D.C. I'd, stop, I'd work on the rulemaking process to keep the EPA from driving Wyoming to not being able to transport coal out to uh, Washington or Oregon, where we're trying to get it out of here. I mean, right now we run coal up through Canada, but we can't run that much up there. Just We need bigger ports and we need more access. We have people in Washington and, and Oregon who don't want that to happen, and the EPA is helping them by uh, changing rules through the rulemaking process. They're going back changing rules to the Clean Water Act and the NEEP Act and a whole variety of acts from 40 years ago that the intent was different than they're trying to make it now. The president has a new policy, so they're going out. He's telling his folks, hey, figure out how we can make this happen. Congress isn't going to help us, so let's figure out how we can make it happen. I'm going to use my pen, my phone, whatever it takes. And they go and they write a new rule. They put it out there for us all to look at on the Federal Register. We look at it, and they get, in some cases, two million comments. And most of those comments are negative. No, this is wrong. We don't want to count a, a temporary stream that goes across my property uh, as a, a stream that goes into the EPA's control. That's crazy in my mind. That's not the original intent of that law, but they get it passed because they look at, at the public's comments and they go, that's all right, the president wants it, it's done. Well, the thing that I would do is I would put a one-page bill, single-page bill, very simple. It would say every final rule, whether it be on an old law or a new law, needs to go back to Congress for a vote. Now, I'm going to catch some flack from folks in the House and Senate on that, and that's fine. But I think the public, if they understood how that system worked a little better, they would want to hold somebody responsible, somebody accountable. Because right now, those unnamed, unelected bureaucrats, you cannot hold them responsible. But if the House and the Senate did an intent check, they came back and said, yep, that's exactly what we meant with this law when we passed it, and they vote for it, now, if we don't like it, we can fire them. Granted, I'm hoping to be one of those people who can fire, but I spent 27 years in the military between the Air Force Academy and active duty, and I don't have a problem with accountability. So, let me say, so Congress has a hard enough time signing off on its own expense reports. Sure. How are you planning to have them sign off on every regulatory, like every new rule that gets approved? Wow, and I, I already hit on that. You bring back that regulatory power back to the states, they don't need to be doing everything they're doing in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., or Congress itself, has taken on way more than they were ever uh, expected to from the Founding Fathers. They have way more, um, uh, a much wider range of topics that they utilize. And they're, they're, they have a tendency to try to take care of every person, every little issue. That's not their role. That's the state's role. And that's the individual's role. If we bring back the power back to the states, if we actually paid attention to the Tenth Amendment for once, we would be able to reduce the workload in Washington, D.C., reduce drastically the money that goes to Washington, D.C. to keep it running, and we would be able to go ahead, and they would be able to go ahead and look at every one of those final rules. Most of those final rules shouldn't even be there. They should be in the state. So I feel like you've got a good, you've got a coherent vision of, of where, where you'd like to get. Absolutely. And, and what, what I haven't heard is how you get there realistically. I mean, because I mean, I'm and no offense no, to your diplomatic I, skills, but one man with diplomatic skills, frankly, is just not going to turn the entire train around. I and absolutely agree. Reverse the process of federalization of, of many things. Nope, I absolutely agree. Um, and fortunately, this year we've seen several people who've been in Congress for a very long time who are very set in their ways lose their opportunity to run in, in Nebraska, in uh, Virginia and in other places. We've seen that happen. There are getting to be more and more people that are realizing that the debt is a massive problem. And they realize that the, the overreach of government is a massive problem. So it, it won't be just me. There'll be a lot more people who are out there looking at that. And the more incumbents, that, you know, the folks that have been there 18, 24, 30 years in the Senate, the more of them that leave, the more opportunity there will be to talk to the people who come in and who, who are now looking at this massive debt in front of us and going, yeah, we got to do something about this. And so that's, that's one way. And the other way is just to go to the American people 
uh, to go to the people of Wyoming in particular, but in order to get that uh, rulemaking rule passed or law passed, uh, which by the way, I shouldn't have to do. It's, you know, it's more common sense that Congress is the only one who can pass law. They do the rulemaking to make statutes which become de facto law. Yeah, I think there's something there people should be looking at. But once to get that law passed, I'll have absolutely no problem standing up on the news every week and saying, hey, you know, Georgia, your folks here are not wanting to vote for this. Although Georgia, they probably would. Um, you know, New York, your folks aren't wanting to vote for this. And here's, here's what they're not voting for. They're not voting to be held accountable. You write them, you tell them you want them to be held accountable. You want an opportunity to be able to fire somebody who's not doing the job for you. Because right now you don't have that. And I have no problem going out and being very vocal about things like that. So a lot of, I mean, a lot of the federal debt load and a lot of, a lot of the load that's out there comes from existing obligations. Sure. Uh, including some pretty significant costs when it comes to Social Security and sure. otherwise. What do you do with existing promises then if you're looking at those total remakes? Well, you're, you're, you're absolutely going to have to address that. And, and how we addre have addressed it for years is just by pushing it back a little farther and farther and we don't ever really address the core of the problem. Social Security was never meant to be the only income that somebody has. It was meant as a, a, a fallback and a, a kind of an emergency kind of thing. We need to get back to that. Um, and we can't do that with the folks who are out there right now who are on Social Security. Most of them are on fixed incomes. We recognize that. And we have to deal with that. What we can do when we get rid of that regulatory bureaucracy is we can make uh, things like Social Security and Medi Medicare much stronger because we can have a whole lot of savings. And we can make that work for the people who are on it now. And in the future, we need to change the methodology. And we need to figure out a better way to do that. And one of those ways is, is convincing Americans that they need to take care of themselves. And most Americans used to do that. And I think Americans will do that now if they're weaned from government programs over time. It's not going to happen tomorrow. But that could be tough medicine for a state like Wyoming that actually makes money off, off of the federal government. It between, is. Between what we get with education you know, that's a true statement. But how much money do we have sitting in the rainy day fund now? We have over a billion dollars in there. We have seven to eight billion dollars, I think, is the last numbers that I saw, uh, that the state has that we're, we're making money off of. Wyoming is, should be leading the charge across the nation and saying, hey, look at us. We're in the black. We don't have a problem in going in debt in the state of Wyoming, and we're going to take care of our people. And you all should do the same. And we're not going to be voting to take care of everybody else's people from now on. And I think you'll start seeing other states doing the same thing. So you've spent most of your professional life outside the state. How can Wyoming voters uh, know that you're in touch with, with their needs and what they, they Well, I, I have, uh, you know, I grew up in, in Sheridan. I, actually, I went to grade school in Cheyenne. Then I ended up uh, finishing up uh, junior high and high school in Sheridan. I did go to the Air Force Academy, and then I spent 22 years and nine months, almost 23 years on active duty. Some people have had an issue with me saying 23 years. Okay, fine, 22 years, nine months. Um, <clears throat> and then I came back to Wyoming three and a half years ago, and I retired. I always knew I was going to come back to Wyoming. I've always spent time in Wyoming. I always come back to Wyoming. Every boss I ever had, if you went and talked to him, they'd tell you two things. One, Brian's tenacious. He'll never let go of something until you know that he thinks is right until it's done. And number two, he will never shut up about Wyoming. I talk about Wyoming all the time. I've lived in Wyoming. I've always had a car registered in Wyoming. Uh, even when I was outside the state, I've never been a resident anywhere else except when I, you know, before I was six, before I got here to the state. Okay? And then I didn't even know it because I was only six. But I've never been anything but a resident of Wyoming. Um, I have a lot of friends across the state. I've spent the last three and a half years running my uh, consulting company, an energy and infrastructure consulting company, teaching companies how to site where they have the least impact on the local community, the environment, and the uh, and government missions, not because I'm green, but because I'm trying to figure out or help these companies figure out how to place something so that they have the least impact down the line and we as taxpayers on the backside don't have to pay to mitigate the problems they cause. It's kind of a novel concept. Um, and I took that from my last job in the military where I was protecting our aerospace uh, defense radars from wind turbines. All those big wind turbines you have out here, they have a detrimental effect on, on radars. And I got good at figuring out how to stop that from happening, so I did. So my business is going around talking to companies and cities trying to figure out how to you know, get consulting jobs. So I spent the last three and a half years doing that. And while I'm out, I'm talking to people, and I just heard over and over and over again, you know, people aren't happy, people aren't happy. When I started my business, 
I was shocked. I have a, my business is actually very simple. It's, you know, I have a phone, I have a car, I have a computer and a, a, you know, a shredder and a printer and, and I do consulting. And I go around and I talk to people at length, write up reports, do all kinds of simple job. When I started my business, the federal bureaucracy to try to do either state contracts or government contracts or, or just keeping up with my own taxes. Now, I can't do my own taxes anymore. It's too complicated. I looked at that and said, man, what did I spend all this time in the military for? I come, come out and, and people aren't kidding. When you're in the military, you are a little bit sheltered from that. And when I came out, I thought, my goodness, this is crazy to all these rules and regulations out there. You know, I, if I have a, a little uh, can of oil in my car, in my business vehicle. I got to have it in a certain container and you know, identify it. Wow, never had to do that in the civil world, at least in my private car. What do I got to do for the business? You know, just those things made, made life you know, complicated. So I talked to people all around the state. Hey, you know, how hard is it for you? People who run grocery stores or people who run gas stations uh, or like my brother who runs a fly shop. He's got millions of flies and all this uh, product that he's got to keep track of and sell. I almost don't see how they can do it the way the regulations are. And yet, again, it's one of those things that when I looked at it and talked to all these people around the state, I couldn't figure necessarily Cheyenne for that. I could only finger D.C. And then I started looking at why, and I realized it's because there's people that have been there way too long and they're too darn comfortable taking money from big companies to stay in D.C. so that they can help the big companies. And big companies can deal with that because they have lawyers all over the place. They have CPAs and everything else. We don't. And I want to fix that. Any other questions? Well, so I'll give you a chance to wrap up, and I, I guess I want to frame it this way: Why should we, why should we vote for you as opposed to Mike Hennessy? Well, I think uh, I think overall there's uh, there has been a well, other than my experience and all the things we talked about here, and you can go on my website and you can look at all that too. Uh, you know, I won't go into you know hours of everything I've done. But the big thing is you hear all the time people talking about Obamacare, people talking about the IRS scandals, the CIA scandals, you know, um, uh, the, the things that are going uh, overseas, Benghazi, Syria, all those. You hear about all these things out there. Those are symptoms. Those are symptoms of a much larger problem that we have in Washington, D.C. Um, and I see it as a disease, and I want to go be part of the cure for that disease. I want to go to Washington, D.C. I want to reset the power structure that is out there. I want to go back to the fundamental principles that are in the Constitution, have the federal government do the few things that they are supposed to be doing, bring all the rest back to the states, including the regulatory powers, and let states and individuals run their lives, run their businesses, and be able to prosper. I don't like the government stepping in on everything. I don't like them telling us that uh, Common Core from the federal level is the right way to go. I, that infuriates me that they tie money to things like that. The states could do that. If the states want to do things like that, they can work with other states to make it happen. And I've had people go, well, the National Governors Association started that. Well, they did, but they gave it to the feds. Bad idea. Leave it at the state level. The states can work that out. Governors work together much better than the state and then the federal government driving the states. So ultimately, my goal to bring the power back to the states, I think, is the primary reason people should vote for me. And on top of that, I will never, ever, ever vote for an internet sales tax. Thank you. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Appreciate it.